My guest today, Simona Irwin, had a successful career in the organic foods industry and two young children when her mental and physical health broke down. She is going to share with us her powerful recovery and transformation journey and the nervous system regulation practices and self-inquiry work that made the biggest impact. And I was eager to invite Simona on my channel, not only because she is a wealth of healing wisdom, but also because she has experience with complex PTSD, which I haven't yet covered in depth on my channel. Some of you watching may have CPTSD or PTSD stemming from childhood or from the harrowing experience of chronic illness itself. And in the second half of our interview, Simona will share how PTSD can show up in the journey and some strategies for working with it. Simona, I am so honored to have you here today and be sharing your story and wisdom. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here too. So before we get into sharing your wisdom and practices to help people regulate their nervous system, I'd love to provide some background and talk about your life before your perfect storm. Yeah, absolutely. So my perfect storm happened, well, one of them, I feel like I've had a few throughout my life, but the latest one was around March of 2020. So before that, I was a busy mom of two. I had a really pretty big career in the natural and organic food industry. I was actually running a infant formula company in the U.S. and Canada that specialized in goat milk formula. And I was really busy and I had a big life with my kids trying to do all of my attachment parenting things and run this company and all of this stuff. And I really enjoyed my life. I was traveling all over for work and it felt good, but it was really busy and it was filled with a lot of pressure. So um, my perfect storm was in response to many things, but one of the things was an allergic reaction to an antibiotic that I took. You know, it was already the beginning of COVID. So that was a factor. I had a lot of childhood trauma, which we'll get to a little bit later. You know, was busy, was burnt out. There was a lot of things that were it was compounding and compounding. But then I had this eye thing and I took this antibiotic and almost a few hours I started to get like the redness and, you know, the regular kind of reaction to it. So I didn't take it again. But then what I noticed that night is that I just was not able to sleep. And I had this very strange, weird feeling and this fitful sleep. And then actually that continued for three days. And I really wasn't actually able to sleep for three days. And I was getting more and more symptoms of this different reaction. My body felt very, very strange. My mind was like really racing. And then it kind of from there just really continued in um, this unexpected direction that I, you know, would never wish on anyone. <laughs> yeah. And now hindsight being 2020, it sounds like the nervous system was very triggered by the antibiotics or the reaction and the nervous system wasn't able to return to homeostasis. It stayed on high alert, it sounds like. So what were some of your key symptoms as this didn't go away? Yeah, so really almost within just a couple of weeks, I developed dysautonomia, which affected me in so many different ways. So Basically, my heart rate had gone to somewhere between 120 and 130 and just stayed like even at night when I was trying to sleep, it was that high all the time. I had challenges with like getting up, low blood pressure, really dizzy, lots of vestibular issues, really just kind of felt like I lost control of all of the autonomic functions of my body. 
I remember even my pupils were dilating and then going really small. And I was like, what is happening? It seems like everything's kind of malfunctioning. And it was really, yeah, it was really scary. But for me, really the worst parts were the sleep interruptions. So this really intense insomnia, which I had never heard of anyone else having, where I literally maybe slept for one hour a night for like consistently ongoing. And then also this very high level of anxiety, all these blood sugar issues. It was kind of like the whole operating system just exploded. Yes. And these symptoms sound familiar as I'm someone who had formerly had ME-CFS and the insomnia overlap. I had it bad, but not your extreme level. And I had it bad. <laughs> and the dysautonomia. Mm -hmm. So did you know, oh, this is my nervous system early on, or I'm sure you probably went down some rabbit holes. You did say you were in the organic space. Yeah. Yeah. So I had had a time in my early 20s where I had a similar feeling. So it had been, you know, 20 years since I had really felt that way. But there was some like reminders for me of a perfect storm I had that time that took me around three years to kind of really recover from. And I was very much in the organic world, but I also kind of like have a foot in both worlds. So I did go to the doctor, I got all the heart tests, I got every test you could imagine, you know, had the heart thing hooked up to me for like a week, all of that stuff. And then I also went to a naturopathic doctor and was trying to kind of figure out like what was happening. No one really understood exactly what was happening because it was just like so severe. But I was also pretty, I didn't feel calm, but I was able to express myself calmly. So it was a bit tricky because it was like people weren't really taking it too seriously because I wasn't totally hysterical. But yet we weren't getting any answers. So eventually my naturopath, I started to ask her, I was like, okay, well, last time this happened, I was in a moldy house and I had, you know, all these different parasites and stuff. And I had done it that way the first time. So I asked her for these tests and she kind of just looked at me and said, you know what, I think I'm going to do you a disservice if I give you the Lyme and the mold and all of these diagnoses. And she said, you probably have all of them. And I think you need to do this brain retraining nervous system stuff because you're just going to be on a wild goose chase if you do this other route. Wow. The naturopath actually told you to do the brain retraining nervous system regulation work, knowing that you had been down that route before and it did help, but she saw you this time and she could see that this was yeah. nervous system dysregulation and maybe you did have all these things but she saw this for you and wow that is amazing that she told you that because yeah. some practitioners they really believe in their protocols and not all of them are just in it for the money but some really do promote their protocols as the only way to heal so that's yeah. just really amazing yeah it was amazing I was so grateful and of course because I was so activated and so much in that like fight or flight energy you know it was hard to hear that I was like no I just you know you need to give me something and you know it has to be something but then I also you know there was a part of me that was like okay maybe this can be an option and I was really grateful for it I started with the DNRS program and we can talk a little bit about that but where it helped me the most is that because I got into it within a few months of that kind of perfect storm period, and I learned about this idea of associations and starting to associate symptoms with food, environment, people, et cetera, it really helped me to be aware of that and to do that as little as possible. Even though my brain was doing it, it wanted to make all the connections. Mm -hmm. I was able to know that from the start. And I think that probably saved me a decade of going down all these different rabbit holes. Yes. 
Yeah, the associations. And also, as we make those associations, it takes a little bit more work sometimes to rewire those. And these can happen subconsciously as well. Like you had mentioned mold before. I wasn't even aware of the mold, but my body was. So it was making those connections every time it was rainy, even after I had gotten out of the mold and having shutting down responses. Yes. All right. So I guess you didn't go down rabbit holes. I was going to ask things you tried that didn't work, but (laughs) I'd love to hear some key epiphanies you had first doing the DNRS program and then perhaps the other programs and methods that you found helpful. For sure. Yeah. So, you know, I still found myself, of course, like we all do in little rabbit holes of, you know, finding another naturopath who would recommend supplements and, you know, all these different ways. But I was pretty good at eventually being like, oh, and reining myself back. So for the most part, for the first nine months or so, I really worked mostly with uh, DNRS. And it was really helpful for me because it gave me this education of nervous system being stuck in the on position. It gave me this awareness of over associating with symptoms, with food, with environment, subconsciously, like you said, or consciously. And it gave me this sense of agency that was like, okay, even though I feel totally just horrendous, there's some hope here. And so that was really helpful for me. The parts that were not super helpful for me is because of my background with complex trauma, this idea of really turning away from emotion and turning towards mood elevation and kind of ignoring some of the relational things that were coming up in relation to my symptoms, when I kept turning away from them and kept moving away from unpleasant feelings I was having, I was starting to almost recreate a bit of a pattern I had in my childhood of ignoring, you know, when things were uh, difficult or painful. (laughs) And so there was this like helpful component and a little bit of this kind of re-traumatization component And, you know, it was what it was. I was grateful for it at the time, but then my anxiety and insomnia, and I started to have these really intense, intrusive thoughts that were really scary to me. That really peaked around six months of religiously following the program. And so from there, I knew that I needed something else. And I found the DARE response, which is like an anxiety OCD style book and program. It's an app and it's about moving towards what is challenging and moving towards the fear and really challenging the thoughts. And for me, that was the second part that was a huge game changer for me. Wow. And thank you so much, Simona, for sharing this with us because There are listeners out there who have tried programs like DNRS, which I did myself, who have experience with trauma or chronic trauma in childhood, and also those who are taught to suppress emotions. And emotions, of course, need to be felt. And yeah, there's no one program that's perfect for everyone. DNRS, it's the dynamic neural retraining system. And there is a large component of positivity. It's about really going into joy and elevating your emotions. So while for me, that was really helpful because I was not a suppressor, I'm the opposite. (laughs) It was very helpful, but I'd see time and time again, people who were taught it safe to suppress their feelings, they have to go somewhere. And we can't just rewire our way out of these emotions. So I'm really grateful to have you on here to give people wisdom, but also let them know that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important. You know, all of these different modalities, it's like there's different ones that really suit different people with different backgrounds. And I also believe that there is a sequence uh, that makes sense for each one of us. It's like, You know, I might find, you know, DNRS was probably just right at the beginning and gave me this hope. 
And, you know, maybe I wouldn't have been able to do the exposure stuff with anxiety if I didn't have a bit of the regulation that DNRS started to provide for me. So I really believe for all of us, there's a wisdom and a trust in the journey that we take, which is nice to feel. It's like we all want it to be two weeks long. And, you know, for many of us, it's a multi-year journey, but it progresses and it can progress in ways that are healing beyond our symptoms. And I'll kind of talk to that a little bit more too, as we go along. Yeah. So the DARE response, that's an app. Yeah. So it's a book called the DARE response, and then there's an app. Basically, the premise is that, you know, anxiety, fear is just something that happens. And as we get kind of washed with adrenaline, we become more and more sensitive. And then the whole world smells, sounds, light, temperature, just feel so much more intense, ultimately. And that was really my experience. It felt like I remember saying to someone, it's like a normal person feels 500 layers between them and life. And it was like overnight, I had no skin. (laughs) And it was like every noise, every smell, every sound, you know, everything was just like right in me. It's like I could taste the smells and, you know, all of that kind of classic stuff. So the dare response really helped me by saying, you know what, that's just being overly sensitized from adrenaline. And same with the ruminating and the intrusive thoughts is just also from being oversensitized. And the way forward is to really just allow it to be there, respond to it in an indifferent way, and, you know, get a little bit more playful with it and ultimately stop fearing the fear. Ooh, stop fearing the fear. Yes. So thank you also for going into more detail about your experience with, it sounds like you had chemical sensitivities, light sensitivities, all of those sensitivities that's common for a lot of people watching or listening today. Yeah. Yeah. And I had sensitivities throughout, but sometimes they were more elevated than others, like with light or with food, when I had crashes or what have you. But that's an interesting approach and it's slightly different than DNRS way of presenting it. Yeah. So after this program, was there deeper work that you ended up exploring? Yeah. So just a little bit after is when I found Kathleen King, who runs the Primal Trust program. You know, I had one meeting with her that really changed everything for me. Mm -hmm. And she is just a very special human and has become a good friend of mine too. But I kind of told her a bit about my symptoms and a bit about my challenges. And, you know, she both like pushed back on me to see things a bit differently and also really shared from the heart some of her own experiences, especially around anxiety and the intrusive thought piece. And she just had a way of making me feel like I wasn't alone and that there was a lot of hope and possibility. And there's something about her where she was just authentically herself. And it was like, you know what, I want that. Like, I actually don't want to go back into my old life. There's something here. And she kind of shared that with me. She's like, there might be something calling you that is far beyond your old life. And what would it be like to really let this all fall apart? and to allow something totally new to be built. And that seemed crazy to me. (laughs) As a control like person, I was like, no, I just need to be the perfect mom and the perfect worker and, you know, make this life for myself. And she was like, maybe life is calling you to something else. And, you know, maybe you could surrender to it a little bit more. And so I took her program And I did a lot of really deep inner work, including a lot of work with emotions from journal speak to like expressive writing to, you know, working all the primal trust modules. And through that process, I think it was kind of like 13 or 14 months into my journey. I really, truly felt like the fight or flight response had turned off. And I felt very, very much like myself in a lot of ways. And my journey continued to in other ways. 
Wow. I just love Dr. Kat. She's the real deal. And she has such an inspiring and powerful story. She was one of my favorite guests. <laughs> and I went through primal trust too. There's the nervous system regulation practices, and there's that self-discovery element. Yeah. Can you talk about some key discoveries that the Primal Trust program helped you with, and maybe just a little bit more on Primal Trust's approach versus maybe a standard just brain retraining alone program? Yeah, for sure. So for me, you know, there's so much richness in the program, but for me, when I went, there was just the mentorship, which is now like the level two program. And so for me, what I discovered through her material was this idea of the divided mind state and this idea of part of me wanting some things and part of me not wanting some things. And so I was able to start to look at that differently and tell more honest truths about what do I want in life? You know, who am I? And actually, am I actually angry about certain things that I haven't spoken to? And are there conflicts in my heart and in my life that I haven't really worked out? And, you know, we also look in some ways, if we choose to, about this idea of like, what are my symptoms really keeping me distracted from? And if I didn't have these symptoms, what would I need to deal with in my life that maybe would be totally overwhelming or way too challenging? And the way she does it is in a very trauma-informed choice way. It's not about like self-blame or that I wanted this. It's just an invitation to look a little bit deeper and start to take care of our life in different ways. And when we do that, we actually start to notice that the symptoms change on their own without a lot of effort. Ooh, and I just want to emphasize that it's very trauma-informed, her program. And it is not self-blaming in any way because mm -hmm. I did see in a forum the other day, they were like, oh, my kid went to this clinic and she was told to write down the secondary gain she's getting from being sick. And it is not that at all. It's Dr. Katz's program is so empowering the way she does it. And it does call you to do the deeper work. So I just want to emphasize that none of us are wanting this illness. Oh God, no. No, no. <laughs> but I've seen time and time again, people, even people who were in biomedical studies for research on blood tests, biomarkers for these chronic illnesses, very biomedical people, very against any type of self-blame have found her program and have had such powerful healing and transformation. So- just want to put that out there that yeah, it's us. Dr. Kat has been there. You have been there. It's not just a doctor brushing you off saying you really want these symptoms because you don't want to do this others. It's not like that at all. So I just want to extend my heart out to people who might be triggered by that. But I think you can tell just from our, our conversation here that we're coming from a place of we've been there. Yeah, I think it's so important to name that because, yeah, I think there can be some confusion with that. And, you know, the way that I love approaching it is like all we're doing is learning about the operating system of our brain and our body, right? And so we start to learn in this program that, you know, all of these are automatic responses. They're not a choice, right? And I don't make some sort of choice to like, oh, I hope I feel really anxious and don't sleep. You know, I would never choose that. But sometimes something happens in the body, in the system, where it feels like that might be a better and safer response compared to the threat that it imagines happening to, right? And so... What this work does is it allows us to work with these natural responses and we actually get to cue the body using inquiry to be like, is it the better and safer way or could we be safe in this way too? And we just, all we learn to do is work with what we've got. You know, we didn't choose it. We don't want it. We literally all want it to be different <laughs> and we're starting to discover, okay, well, how can I work with these automatic responses in a way that is honoring and true for myself, but also works to get me out of this really difficult situation? 
Wow. Yeah. So it sounds like you did DNRS for the six months, then you did the DARE program, and then you spent a while on Primal Trust. Yeah. And I like what you said, that it's not always two weeks. I mean, some people can have major gains and certain programs, but this is setting you up for the rest of your life. Yes. And so it can seem like, oh, why isn't happening fast? And that's what we're sold in medicine. We're giving you this pill or what have you, but this is really setting you up for life. I would like to talk specifically about PTSD now and complex PTSD and how that showed up in the journey and ways for working with that. Yeah, this is such a good question. And I always preface it with, of course, I'm not a therapist and I'm not a mental health professional. So definitely just from my experience, but I think it's such an important topic. And, you know, it's something that so many of us in the chronic illness community deal with. So without getting into tons of content about my life, I can share that I had quite a turbulent childhood you know, there's this kind of test and it's an imperfect test of these adverse childhood experiences. Of course, it misses some really important things like racial pieces and other pieces, but it covers some intense experiences and I actually have them all. So some people have a three or a four and that kind of says, oh, well, you know, you're 50% more likely to have a chronic illness. And I had all of them. So it was difficult. I had an addicted parent and then the other person in the house, my sibling had schizophrenia and it was just a really difficult time. And then I actually had a period of almost eight years where I was without a home. So staying at other people's houses, partially homeless, and a lot of stuff happens when you're a teenager and you have no one really taking care of you. So, you know, there was a lot that I've had to deal with. And still, I didn't really understand what that meant or how that would show up in my life later. And what I like to speak to with people, I think none of us really understand what does trauma look like when it comes up again? And trauma is very relational. And so what I found in my own journey was the way it showed up was how I related to the symptoms and sensations that came up. So when I initially had that allergic reaction, you know, maybe someone without childhood trauma would have been like, wow, that was weird. And, you know, taken some Benadryl and, you know, gone on and figured it out and it would have kind of changed and gone away. What it brought up for me was this intense vulnerability to harm. And then I also didn't sleep. And that reminded me of times in my life when I didn't have a safe place to sleep. And so it really, my brain kind of opened up, connected to all this old stuff, and then brought all this intense material up. But I didn't know it because it didn't come with an actual memory. It was all just sensations and how I related to my experience. So it was like really sneaky kind of underground way, but it really kept my system highly elevated. And it was like I was living in basically a PTSD flashback but I didn't know that that's what was happening. Oh, my heart goes out to you. Thank you for being so vulnerable, Simona. There are people out there watching this channel who have PTSD and who might not have made these connections yet with the chronic symptoms and then our response to the symptoms mm -hmm. as well. I would like to just get your input on PTSD and its relationship with and differences from things like chronic fatigue or depression, fibromyalgia. There's research that shows these are nervous system conditions, but I'd like to get your thoughts on that, on what are some of the similarities here and then the differences. Yeah, you know, I think the nervous system obviously is a huge role in everything. And I think for most of us who have found our way to complex chronic illness, likely have either some sort of trauma ourselves or generationally through our parents or our ancestors that's kind of partially getting 
moved through or played out in our illness. And of course, this is, you know, my opinion <laughs> and through my own experimentations with myself and other people that I work with, you know, this is something that we kind of talk about. So like everything, I always encourage people to think about it and try it out. And, you know, does that feel true for me? And if it does, check it out. And if it doesn't, find the thing that does feel true. But for me, this relational piece and the way that my symptoms made me feel, and also the way that I seem to be acting things out. So I noticed, for example, when I was finally able to take a bit more of a witness view, I was like, okay, what actually happens when I'm not sleeping? And, you know, what's going on here? And I noticed actually, oh, I kept having these repetitive thoughts and this image of, oh, you know, my life's going to fall apart and it's going to crash and I'm going to end up being homeless or it's going to be these things. And it's like, okay, my brain is taking something from the past and it's showing me this possibility in the future and it's scaring me so much that now I can't even sleep and I'm just trying to fix it. And so what would it be like to one, notice that I might be replaying my trauma and two, to consider that I don't have to believe that future image that my mind is showing me. And once I, you know, and I say this really calmly and easily now, because obviously <laughs> I'm much more regulated now, but this was not easy in the moment, but I did it anyways. And I started to challenge it. And I was like, okay, what if that image is not true? And what if I'm just having a bad night? And what if I don't know what tomorrow brings? And the more I started to bring that in, the more my nervous system started to find some ease. And then the second piece was that I would start asking myself, what do I feel? And what do I need? And these were questions I did not get through my childhood experience. So it's like, what am I feeling? Well, I'm feeling angry or scared or worried. Okay, well, what do I need in this moment? Well, I just need a hand on my chest, you know, or I just need to ask for someone to sit beside me, or I just need something delicious to eat right now, whatever it is. And I started to do that. And so I started to relate to my symptoms differently. I started to be in touch with my emotions and I started to meet my needs. And from there, this tanglement of complex trauma and chronic illness started to kind of detangle. Wow. What do I feel and what do I need? There were three components. There was first a recognizing that these projections of the past might not be true for my current situation. And then what do I feel and what do I need? And when we're in that fight or flight state, or just, you know, throughout the day, if you're chronically ill, I just remember I would have like gut, my gut was telling me this was bad or, but my own instincts were shaped by the trauma of the illness. And it was learning that actually that's not intuition. That gut sense was way off. <laughs> But then I like, how do you deal with it? What do I feel and what do I need? Mm, I love that you said that. That's so important. And that was such a big part of my journey too, where I was like, oh my goodness, what I thought was the voice of my intuition and instinct has actually been a fear protector response this whole time. And that's not you know, when it says like, oh, maybe you shouldn't eat that, or there's lectins in that, or my histamine this, or, you know, the, the smell is going to hurt my liver or, you know, all these things. I was like, no, that's not my intuition. That's this fearful protector voice. And yeah, this journey, I was going to say that it's like a beautiful journey. It doesn't necessarily feel beautiful in the moment, but it is beautiful in hindsight. <laughs> where you actually get to meet your true inner voice eventually in this journey. Ooh, yes. We actually get to discover our true intuition that had kind of gotten pushed to the wayside for the things that really matter in life. Yes, so true. You know, and one of the things, you know, I was just talking about this this morning with a group of people and even that voice that's like, you know, be afraid of this or be afraid of this, this overbearing voice. For me at one point in my journey, part of my work has been discovering the good intention of all of my parts. 
And so when I think about that voice that maybe was like really overprotective and always trying to guide me in all these ways, I think of it, it's like, all I wanted my whole life was someone who was really attuned with me, who saw me, who was wanting to take care of me and kind of mother me in this way. And it's like, oh, this is what that voice is trying to do. You know, it might be a bit misguided and like a little extra, <laughs> but maybe it's good intention is to really try to take care of me and I can take care of myself now. You know, I don't need that. Yeah. So just to fill the audience and who might not be familiar, you use the word parts. And I think that comes from IFS, inner family systems, the different parts of ourselves. Can you just quickly describe that? for? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the way I see it, and I'm not an IFS therapist or trained, but I've always been someone who's kind of been aware of these different parts and sides of me. Yeah, is that ultimately one way that we can look at the different aspects of ourself is this idea that they're parts and they're created maybe at different ages or times in our life and they're, you know, protective or responsive in certain ways or they're exiled parts of us that hold some of our deep wounding. And so I love how Kat kind of gave us some options. She was like, you know, you can think of them as parts. You can also just think of them as neural networks in your brain that hold certain levels of experience or ages of experience. And so I like to kind of name them as parts. And yeah, I think it's a really nice way to be able to relate again a little bit differently and with more compassion and uh, inclusivity with what's coming up. Yes, inclusivity and incorporating that part because in some brain or training programs, it's about this is a misfire or a not ideal neural pathway and we're creating a new one. You are saying that for you, it felt more true and helpful to be able to include that part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a powerful difference in a way to go about this brain or training nervous system work. Yeah, you know, I won't go too far on a tangent with this, yeah. but one of the things I talk a lot about in the program is this idea of what we put a lot of fear and attention into, the brain prioritizes and repeats, right? And so one of the things when we start to think of our symptoms and thoughts more relationally, and we don't, you know, meet them, like if we have a pain that comes up, and we become hysterical about that pain, and we keep checking on it, and we have a story or this is going to become chronic and we're so scared, then actually what happens in the brain is that's like, wow, Simona loves this. She's so interested. She's checking on this all the time. She's got all this emotion. This seems important for survival. So let's make this big neuro pathway and keep this coming, right? Versus if I notice like, oh, I have this pain or I get really fatigued and I'm just like, you know what? You're welcome here too. You know, you can be with me and I don't need to believe any of those future images about what this might look like tomorrow. I'm just going to include you and, you know, have you here. And the brain is like, okay, this is not important. This is not about survival. And so we actually don't need to keep this top of mind and it deprioritizes it. So that was a big piece too of how I worked with my symptoms and the thoughts that came up. It's like, when I can include them and have compassion and love, whatever that looks like, then my body responds differently. When I act with a lot of fear and attention, I notice that it seems to come up more and again and again. Okay. And I do want to ask you, can you talk about the difference between brain retraining and this nervous system work and just ignoring symptoms and pushing through? Because some people here, okay, well, you're just saying, just talk about my symptoms less, forget about my symptoms, push through to be the perfect mom. Yeah, yeah, that's such a good question. So for me, I really like more of this image of, you know, I'm a mom, you're a mom. <laughs> and so sometimes when things are happening with our kids, you know, we sit down, we talk to them, we kind of open up, like, you know, what can we do here? And then sometimes we're like, you know what, honey, I love you so much and we need to go in the car now and I'm going to scoop you up and I'm going to give you a kiss and you're going to come with me and you might be screaming and crying 
and I'm going to do my best to meet your needs, but we're going in the car now, right? And so I like to imagine that. That's what I thought of a lot with my symptoms. I was like, okay, I'm going to be kind. I'm going to include them. I'm not going to push past my limits, but there's going to be times when I choose values over symptoms or values over thoughts. And even if it means, because at one point I had this crazy strict bedtime schedule and eventually I was like, okay, this is not a good choice. I need to be choosing values over whether or not I sleep. And even though I might have three nights of broken sleep, I started to choose that because ultimately, one, it showed my brain that I wasn't afraid of not sleeping. And two, you know, the symptom was happening anyways. So why not enjoy a little bit of my life, even if there was a little bit of suffering after? And I could use that suffering as a new way to even relate to myself and comfort myself. Ooh, yes. So I got really into a circadian rhythm, perfect sleep hygiene before kids. And it kind of went off, laugh, you know. But yeah, it is about that balance. And you did say it's not about pushing through because we did that and it kind of got us here in the first place, <laughs> got many of us here in the first place. But it is about the values. And I think that's another part of the Dr. Katz program. And I'm really glad you're bringing this up because she has you look at your values and explore what those are. So when you're doing this brain retraining, you're connecting it to the values and you're living that. And that I feel is so life affirming and salutogenic to tap into their values versus just only doing this perfect diet lifestyle brain retraining. Just are you working towards a life you love and the values and living them? Yeah, I love that. It's so important because at the end of the day, we don't want to be stuck in any sort of regimented box. We don't want to find our freedom by basically taking away all of our freedom. <laughs> we want <laughs> to be able to live with our symptoms. And for some of us, maybe our symptoms go away. For some of us, maybe we have symptoms that linger or stay. Maybe we are fatigued longer than we want to, or maybe once in a while we have a pain that comes back or a migraine or uh, intrusive thought. And this is life. Like this is being human. So the mindset that I love to encourage, is like, of course, we don't want to be fatigued. Of course, we want to feel better. Like, yes. And we honor that. And how can I honor and show up for this life today that I have, whether I like it or not, how can I start to be kinder to myself? How can I show up in this and start to find what I can love, even with these limitations? Ooh, how can I show up for this life today? That is such a powerful statement. And I know it's a part of the primal trust program, but that is so powerful. what you just said, Simona. And I see all these people suffering out there. They're wanting a cure and stuff. Of course we all want that, but the message I hear so often to people who are chronically ill, it's saying, oh, life doesn't have value until you're fully better. But to, <laughs> it's interesting because I see people improve when they start to recognize and start to create little pockets of like, oh, is this bringing me joy? Am I living my truth mm -hmm. into their life today? Even though it might feel horrible and I am aware of how horrible it could be. So I never had very severe limitations. I was always at least was able to shuffle around my house. I don't want to minimize how bad it can get. But when we start to embrace this is my life, and yeah. how can I show up for myself today? That's so powerful. Yeah, it's so important. Exactly like you said, sometimes we're in it and sometimes it's not good, right? Whether it's an illness or the loss of someone we love, or we live somewhere where there's a war or there's so many different ways that we can be in it in hardship. And we have to be able to, you know, we don't have to, but, you know, we can, even in those moments, start to orient to like, yeah, this is true. And the suffering is true. And I'm going to honor that and name it. 
And, you know, how can I also orient to maybe this little piece of connection I have, or that this person calls me, or this person drops food off for me, or I have a cozy bed. You know, even within the suffering, we can start to find these little moments and start to allow those to build and to orient ourselves to it and get at least some comfort and some joy, even in our challenging times. Yes. And that also speaks to how much having just even one good person in our lives can really make a big difference for people who is supporting us as we go through this journey. So to anyone feeling alone who doesn't have anyone, my heart goes out to you. Yeah, I think that's such the blessing of some of these programs. You know, at the very baseline level, you get connected to a community of people that understand, you know, I work with the Primal Trust program, but it's true for all of these programs. So it's like, find what works for you. And it doesn't even have to be a recovery program. It could be a different online community, you know, but that piece about community and that connection with community and starting to have more social interaction, whatever that looks like, even in the smallest level, can make the world of difference for people. I know many people who have become close friends with people they met from these recovery programs. Yeah. All right. So I do want to talk about, so my audience, most of them have chronic fatigue syndrome, MECFS, POTS. I assume you have to work with these people, what is some wisdom that you have applying these tools for people dealing with CFS, the post-exertional malaise and reflections on that? Yeah. I think so many of the principles really of the program that I work with are really applicable. And the way that we kind of have this like algorithm, which is the way we work with a lot of things. And it's really the first piece is just like awareness. So it's like what's happening. And how I like to work with it is it's almost like a truth telling moment. So this is when we don't have to pretend the bad stuff's not happening. So it's like, what's happening with me today? You know, how do I feel towards it? How does it make me feel inside? What's my mind like? What's my nervous system like? What would it be like to just be allowed to just tell it straight and let it out? And then the second piece is like, okay, if I let the story go, what does it feel like in my body? Right? What are the sensations in my body? How does that feel? How can I be with those with some compassion? You know, even though in the story part, I might have strong feelings. I don't like it. I don't like being tired today. How does that show up in sensation in my body? And how can I be with that? And then those two pieces really honor where I'm at, the truth, and then how it makes me feel. And then the last part is like within the sphere of my control, where do I have agency or choice? And how can I work with that in an honest way? So it's not about pushing myself out of my boundaries or doing something totally difficult. It's just like noticing and orienting the nervous system to, okay, I might be really exhausted today. And my sphere of choice might just be my room or my house. And then in that, how can I show myself that I do have some sort of agency or I can orient to something that could be pleasant? And that is the hardest part because when life isn't showing up the way we want it, you know, we're unhappy, <laughs> which is yeah. fair enough. But part of this journey to help or bring our nervous system to a new state is we can name that and we can feel that and kind of let it out. But the next part and this relational part and this caretaking part is like, okay, and how can I find a way to resource myself today to get a little bit of pleasure, to bring something in to actually show my nervous system that even in this state that I wouldn't have chosen, I am okay. And that is the most potent thing you can do for any of these complex illnesses is we say, yeah, I don't like this. I wouldn't choose it. And I'm going to notice in this present moment, right now, right here, I'm safe and okay. And the more we can keep bringing it back to that, the more we signal the nervous system to start to settle down. And then something different can emerge in our cells or whatever else is affecting our physical state. 
Yes. It's a very beautiful template and there's a lot of flexibility to customize it to what you need in that moment. But yeah, I don't want to give away any copyrighted material or anything, but it's really beautiful. Um, so sorry if any of this sounds vague, but yeah, I love the principles you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, and then the second piece that I encourage people to explore is, am I replaying something from the past? So really exploring, you know, how do I feel towards my fatigue? What do I feel my fatigue is doing to me or taking away from my life? And does this remind me of something I lived through as a child? And sometimes not everyone, but some people might be like, oh, this is exactly like this situation. And then that sometimes gives us a clue and some material where it's like, mm, there might be some unfinished business that's kind of playing out through the body. And we might get a little bit more freedom if we work through some of that material. Yeah. All right. So I'd love to share with the audience some tools they can take away and start applying today and for busy parents as well, going through chronic illness, CPTSD, and complex chronic illness. So yes, you know, I definitely feel like it adds a layer of complexity when you have kids, <laughs> for sure. And you're trying to show up for yourself, you're trying to show up for them. And then there's all sorts of challenges around guilt and shame when our challenges keep us away from being the parent that we want to be. So really my heart goes out to anyone who's parenting alongside this journey because I know it can be really challenging. So in terms of takeaway tools, and I'll kind of blend this with the parenting piece too, one of the things that I like to do is to kind of bring my kids into things when I could. So I really liked to, you know, my biggest tool was coming back into the present moment. It sounds so simple and annoying <laughs> as a tool, but it was really this question of like, okay, where am I right now? What am I believing in my mind? And can I come back into this moment and orient and notice, like, even if life is imperfect, even if my kids are being wild, even if I have these challenges, like right here, right now in this little blip, am I okay? Am I okay? And, you know, if there's one tool that someone can do and just keep coming back to, it's like free. You can do it all day long if you want to. It's really to just notice in this moment, I'm okay. And that in its own is just a very powerful piece. The second thing that I really loved is to start to incorporate some play. And play is a really powerful tool for our nervous system, because if you are able to play, then you're likely safe, right? And so when we actually come towards things with a playful attitude, already we're giving this information to the nervous system, which is like, this is not serious. We're not in danger. You know, we're able to play. So for me, I would include my kids and, you know, we would do like a voo breath and we'd have a competition, like who can hold it the longest? Or if I was really ruminating and distracted, I would just be like, what are my kids doing? And I would do what they were doing. They would be like crawling around or building something or doing Lego. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I need to be doing <laughs> right now. So I took their cues and what I noticed, and it's something actually we're working on in Primal Trust too, is this idea of like the parent-child nervous system. We're starting to work on a bit of like an offshoot of regulate that includes how we can bring these tools to our kids. And so for me, I started to really notice that as I regulated more, my kids regulated more. And the more we included play, then the more regulated also my kids became. And so it was this really beautiful thing that we kind of wove together and I really saw the effects on them as my nervous system changed too. Oh, wow. That's so cool that you guys are developing that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a good one. We're really excited because it is like the number one question people have, right? It's like, one, how can I do this with kids? And then, you know, what do I do when my kids are dysregulated or when I see these symptoms start to pop up in my kids? And so we talk a lot about how we can look at the 
whole family nervous system as one big picture and then how we can work with that. So stay tuned, but coming at some Oh, that's really awesome and pioneering. I'm just so grateful we got to have this wonderful chat today, Simona. So I just love to hear a little bit about how you're helping people now and how you're working with people in your life now. For sure. So yeah, I'm a teacher at the Primal Trust platform and one of the mentors there. So I do a lot of work with Kat. And so people can always find me over on that platform, giving Q and A's. And I do a lot of classes around befriending emotions. I also run a series separately for anyone who is doing brain retraining around fear and befriending fear. It's like a six part series. So every few months I run one of those and people can find me on Instagram at turning towards. And from there, you can find all my info in different ways. So are you helping people one-on-one as well? Yeah, I do individual coaching for people too, who are in different brain retraining programs, obviously, mostly primal trust people, but also sometimes other people. And usually people who are really stuck around the fear response, that tends to be kind of one area that I really work with, with people or people who are noticing some of their old traumas being reenacted through their symptoms. Sometimes I can help people with some parts of navigating with that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's really powerful when someone who's gone through a journey then has the passion to help others. I would love to hear your final words of wisdom for people watching today. Mm, Yeah, so one, thank you for having me. It's always really nice to speak with you and be with you. (laughs) And then, yeah, I mean, it sounds really cheesy. And so I know it might not land with everyone. But what I've discovered and really now almost working with hundreds of people, if not thousands through the program, is that what I've found over and over again, is that there is this beautiful, loving intention of the system that really emerges. And whether, you know, it's in relation to ourselves or how we come home to ourselves or what we end up understanding about the symptoms and maybe how they were trying to protect us in certain ways, I just really love to invite people to know that at the heart, heart, heart of a lot of this is this core of love. And when we find it, and when we really see it and know it, a lot changes. And so I encourage people to consider that as they look at their journey, and consider that there might be some pieces of it that are really here that's for us in a way that we've always wanted things to be for us. And that's just a little piece for me that I came into at some point and it changed a lot for me. Wow. Oh my gosh. I'm tearing up. That was so powerful, Simona. That was so beautifully stated. Thank you so much for sharing your heart, sharing your journey and sharing your wisdom with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Liz. All right. I hope you have a good rest of your day. (laughs) Thank you. So nice to have this chat with you. I really, yeah, I love it and appreciate it. It's my honor. All right. That was so good. 